everyone. How you doing? Yeah, turn it all the way up. How's everybody out there? It's turning fall here in Pennsylvania. The leaves are going yellow and orange and falling down. And it used to be called leaf fall. Mm. So autumn is the real name, but leaf fall is where we get the word fall. And it's fall in Pennsylvania. How are you guys doing? Oh, I see a few people there. I've been told not to spend too much time saying names, but I have to say hi, Jane. Hi, Annie. Hi, Liza. Hi. Oh, hi. And Jessica and Dinah and many, many more. I used to have, we used to have a rule that if we got to 100, we'd start. So that's what I'm going to do. Ha! And if you get in, if you come in and you miss the first few minutes, you'll just have to go listen to the recording or talk to one of your posse mates in the gathering room. Okay, so today's gathering room is called Instant Abundance because I've been thinking how incredibly wealthy it is possible to be without ever leaving my bedroom chair. I can sit down to meditate in my chair um, and some days I can feel anxious and like the, the, there's not enough goodness in the world to go around. And then I can almost flip a switch in my head and realize that there's infinite abundance and I feel instantly rich. Now, I'm not saying that I am not privileged. I know I am. But this worked for me when I was deeply in debt and had no money and was scared about the about bankruptcy and everything. And it still works now that I'm more blessed. So um here's the basic point of the whole gathering room and i keep saying it over and over again um but i need to reiterate it every time because every other thing i say is based on this one idea which is that rather than being physical beings um, that generate consciousness we are consciousness generating a physical body and a physical world so, and this is not just me doing new age, reading new age books. This is me reading a whole lot of physics and um, a lot of philosophy and all the other deep thinkers of the world. So I literally believe that consciousness generates the physical universe. And the physical universe is always sliding into the past. Boom, boom. Now is all we ever have, right? Now is the only thing in the physical present. And it's, the future doesn't exist. The past doesn't exist. And only in the moment that we're conscious of, is there a physical reality? Okay, so apparently other people in history have had the same thought and one of them was named Dante. And as you may know, I, my book that's coming out in April is about integrity, but it's based around Dante's Divine Comedy. And that's considered by some people to be the greatest work of literature ever written down which I thought was kind of a stretch when I first read it. Admittedly, I don't read Italian, but there's a lot of like boring medieval Italian politics in the Divine Comedy. So when I first encountered it, I was like, oh, greatest work of literature in history? I don't think so. Well, then I spent years living with it, reading it, rereading it, and, and like delving into it as a map toward enlightenment. And I came to think that Dante had coded into this poem some of the deepest wisdom of humankind. And even though I didn't quite get it the first read through, I had a sense that it was there. And there's a particular moment that I that really changed my life. It's when Dante has already been through the famous inferno, right? He's already been through hell. And he's fought his way right down through the center of hell. And as I always say, if you go deep enough in the earth, you go through the center of the earth and where you were headed down before, you're now headed up. So heading down into his internal hell, metaphorically, he eventually passes the center and is headed toward paradise. But before he can get there, he has to climb a mountain, the mountain of purgatory. And purgatory literally just means to cleanse. It's where he takes physical action that reflects his freedom from the illusions that got people stuck in the inferno. And when he gets to purgatory, everybody there is happy. Like everybody in the inferno is screaming and yelling and tortured. They could all leave if they wanted to, but they won't give up their beliefs. So they just stay stuck screaming. In purgatory, a lot of people are working really hard and they're climbing this mountain and it's really difficult, but they're all happy. And the reason is that they've seen through their illusions and now they're just purifying themselves through physical effort. 
And when Dante shows up on the mountain, they're like, oh, a newcomer, more good things for everybody. And Dante, who's being accompanied by Virgil, the poet, his, his guide is like, wait a second, another person shows up and that means there's more for everybody. And he says, and I will quote the Longfellow translation. There are many translations of the Divine Comedy, but this is from the Longfellow tran translation. He says, how can a good that's shared by more possessors enable each to be more rich in it than if that good had been possessed by few. So follow the logic here. How can something that's shared by more people, so more people show up to share it, and suddenly every single one of them has more of it than before, than before there were so many people to share with? And right there on the mountain, of course, he gets his question answered and somebody uh, comes out, one of the angels or whatever comes out to teach him. And uh, he says, he starts out by saying, you're caught in the illusion of material reality. And he explains to him exactly what I just said to you. You are a consciousness that generates this physical experience, not a physical experience generating consciousness. He says, all the really good stuff that you're here on earth to gather is non-physical. Most of it registers for you as emotional. So the feeling of having a lot of money we think will give us security, though I know many billionaires, not many, but I know a few billionaires who don't feel secure at all. They're terrified. There was a man in Germany who killed himself because he, in the financial downturn of 2008, he lost so much money, he only had $300 million left. So he killed himself. He was used to being a billionaire and $300 million just wasn't enough. So physical stuff doesn't necessarily give us a sense of security. Um, there's a book called Affluence Without Abun or Abundance Without Affluence about the San people of South Africa, where it talks about how they feel like they live in complete abundance, even though they have nothing that we would call property. But they are so relaxed and trusting of nature. It always feeds them. It always gives them shelter and all the things they need that for a hundred thousand years, they've lived in harmony with it, feeling wealthy, feeling secure, feeling the way we think $300 million would make us feel. Uh, so, and likewise, if we, th we think we had the perfect love, we would feel lovable enough. If we achieved enough, we would feel worthy. But none of these feelings are in fact connected intrinsically to the physical circumstances we think would bring them on. Those are all linked by culture to the thing, the feeling state that's what we really want. If you watch Breaking Bad, there's this guy who becomes a drug dealer and he's, he goes from being a poor high school teacher to being a wealthy drug dealer, but all the money is criminal. So he can't use it without getting suspicion. So he just has this holding, he has a, a security deposit box, one of those safety spaces, what do they call them? Self storage units. And it's filled with a cube, a huge cube of hundred dollar bills but he can't use them. He just goes in and like sits on it. <laughs> and it's like not as comfortable as a chair. So the stuff, the physical stuff we link with value actually isn't what we're after. What we're after is the feeling of being well supplied, of being worthy, of being loved. And all of those things are in fact, non-material in nature. So what the guy is saying to Dante is, for example, if, if you, Say there's a couple, so you and your honey form a couple and you're living in an apartment and COVID strikes. Ah! You decide to adopt a shelter cat because that was one good thing that did happen in New York City is all the animal shelters, all the rescue animals, no, none of them had to be euthanized because they were all adopted because people knew they needed company. So say you're, you and your honey are now isolated. You get a cat, the cat, couldn't care less about COVID. The cat is relaxed the way you want to be relaxed, the way you'd be relaxed if there were no pandemic. The cat is cuddly and the cat's cuddles, which the cat is doing for itself, calm you down and make you feel better. The touch of his fur, the cat settles down between the two of you and purrs and both of you fall in love with the cat. And does that mean that you are less in love with each other? 
no, you're going to love that cat together. And the, the purring of the cat and the love it generates means that there's more for all three of you. So the more people you add into an equation of spiritual value, the more you have. Physical things you have are divided, but spiritual goods are multiplicative. They just, the more you give, the more you get. So um, here, based on that, I have some rules for how to be instantly abundant. And because I never saw an acronym I didn't love, I call this the three G's. And I thought of it in the bathtub this morning. So the first step in being instantly abundant is to first notice what you really, truly want. And that is the feelings that you're after. Feelings of worthiness, lovability, calm, security, peace, freedom, those kinds of things. Once you've noticed that what you want, really want are feelings, you can begin to to operationalize the three G's. The first one is gratitude. You begin looking specifically for places where you can be grateful for even a tiny bit of the feelings that you want. So say you want to feel loved. I was sitting at my window today and I turned and I looked at this tree and I, I watch this tree every day when I meditate and we have kind of a relationship. It was dropping leaves earlier and I read that this particular type of tree drops its leaves when it's stressed. So I started like projecting affection to it. I don't know what happened, but it stopped dropping leaves. And now they're turning yellow and dropping off. And I turned and I saw the tree and I felt this huge bolt of love come from me to the tree. And the tree was saying, I'm going to sleep now, good night. And in doing that, it was creating all this beauty and it was creating a sense of connection and it was creating, I could smell the, the vegetation in the air, the fall air is so beautiful. And I became intensely grateful for the love, for the beauty, for the connection. And it was just looking at a tree. So if you can focus on any kind of gratitude for any, any feeling that you want. So I felt loved by a tree today. Say you want to feel worthy. Find any, like look at yourself through the eyes of your own dog and you will be worthy. Like you can find that and be grateful that your dog thinks you're worthy <laughs> or that I, I do dwell on plants and animals, don't I? But I love nature. So any feeling you want, you can find a trace of it. Start to tend the garden of gratitude because every feeling we have is like growing a little garden. If you water it with attention, it always grows. So if you water feelings of scarcity and panic and neediness, which most people do when they, they think that will get them to wealth and abundance, all that grows is obsessiveness and neediness and grasping. So instead, water the garden of gratitude with your attention. That's the first G, grateful. The second one is generative. We not only can receive good feelings from almost anything around us, we can generate them from within ourselves. And this is what meditation does. You sit there without any additional stimuli until you realize you can get it from inside yourself. So if you can generate a, a good feeling, for example, by focusing on a positive mantra, like um, loving kindness meditation for yourself. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be free from suffering or looking for focusing on memories of things that make you happy like the smell of leaves like the time you saw a comet in the sky like um a wonderful tv show you liked as a kid whatever like start to generate more of those grateful feelings and the the gratitude will start to sprout in all directions gratitude is like the stem cell of good emotions if you get a cell of gratitude, it can sprout into feeling loved, feeling worthy, feeling safe, feeling free, feeling at peace. Gratitude is like a golden ticket. And so generate more of it inside yourself. And then be generous with it. Give it to somebody else. The feeling, not, not stuff, because then you'll feel like, oh, I have less. No, generate something that when you give it, it becomes bigger. So one example of this that I've I think I've quoted to you the Sarah Teasdale poem, Barter. And one of the things she says to be that life, it, it starts, life has loveliness to sell. And she says, sell all you have for loveliness. And one of the things she says is children's faces looking up, holding wonder like a cup. And I had this experience of incredible gratitude and generative generosity 
when our new baby was born and we played music. And this particular baby, more than the other babies that I've had, responds to music almost unlike any other stimulus. And um, right from the beginning when she was tiny, I started playing her, well, she's three weeks old. <laughs> How big is she? <laughs> but <laughs> back then when she was a child, um, but I started playing her classical music and her grandpa in Australia is a wonderful, wonderful songwriter. And he's recorded songs that he's written for her on the guitar. And we have videos and audio of him singing and playing his guitar. And I played her a Gregorian chant. And especially when she hears complex music, like if you just sing to her, she seems happy enough. But when she hears complex music, her face it hold, holds wonder like a cup, like she's completely unconditioned by culture. And when she started hearing like Bach or a Gregorian chant, her eyes and her mouth go into the same, into, oh, they're like, and she's like, and you just, you feel God hearing this music through this particular set of human ears for the first time. And the glory of the experience of hearing music just, man, it just explodes. The idea that in 10 seconds, I haven't heard a Gregorian chant for years, in 10 seconds, I think that would be nice. Something that was written hundreds of years ago, sung decades ago, recorded by stuff that was took forever to invent. And in 10 seconds on the internet, Gregorian chant, there it is. And this new form of God is now hearing it and lighting up with wonder and the world is more full of wonder and the whole family has more wonder in it. We don't have to divide it, it multiplies. So that's an example of a grateful, generative, generous experience. And here, the last thing I have to say is that physical abundance tends to follow spiritual abundance. We think that it follows grasping, it does not. Mark my words, go out and prove it to yourself, try grasping and desperation all you want it doesn't work physical abundance follows spiritual abundance but when it does you don't even really care because it's all about the spiritual abundance when you're happy and you're grateful and you're generative and you're generous everybody's always getting richer so that's what i want to say to you today go out and do the three g's and we'll all be richer and i will now take questions which the gracious badger um mom to badger 2.0 has been fielding for me um i'm not seeing them. there they are okay donna says what are some strategies to find the feeling that you really want we are so conditioned by culture to want things how do we find the feelings that we want and not the ones we think we're supposed to have it's really simple the ones that were that really work for us um they feel delicious we have fascination for them attention without effort um the things that culture wants us to have, I call it the advertising craving. It's like, oh, I need, I need, I need, but there's no joy in it. And when it's something like, I think I'm gonna get up and go sit by a, a window and look at a tree, there's no neediness to it. It's just like, oh, that would be nice. So anything that feels in the body as a pleasure is actually something that is good for your soul. The body and the soul go together. We've also been conditioned to think they go, they're opposite, but they're not. They're the same. The body responds to the soul far more easily than the mind does. So drop the mind and go with what you would love if you had no language and you'll pretty much always score. <laughs> okay, someone says, what version, Jessica says, what version of Dante's Inferno is your favorite? Uh, probably the original, even though I don't read Italian. And I have an Italian friend who says, even if I could read Italian, it's a very old form of Italian. But, um, and I love the Longfellow translation and I used it in my book, partly because um, I didn't want to tread on any living author's toes, but there's a living author named Mandelbaum, M-A-N-D-E-L-B-A-U-M. And his translation is, I think, from what I can tell closest to the original and, and he really nailed it. Like he's, I think he's amazing. So Mandelbaum, there, you were all wondering that all week and now you know. Um, and uh, Mary James says, can you say the name of that poem again? It's called Barter by Sarah Teasdale. And I am going to recite the whole thing to you because it's worth it. And because just hearing this poem 
will give you a instant abundance. Okay, let's see if I get it right. It goes, life has loveliness to sell, all beautiful and splendid things, blue waves whiting on a cliff, soaring fire that sways and sings, and children's faces looking up, holding wonder like a cup. Life has loveliness to sell, music left like a, a curve of gold, scent of pine trees in the rain, eyes that love you, arms that hold, and for your spirit's clear delight, pure delight, holy thoughts that star the night. Sell all you have for loveliness, buy it and never count the cost, for one white singing hour of peace, count, ma count many a year of strife well lost. And for one breath of ecstasy, give all you have been and will be. That's I, one of my favorite poems because she's telling you how to be abundant at the, at the end. She says, take the one breath you're taking now and give up everything that was and everything that will be. And if you can be here in this breath, there is loveliness all around you and all you have to trade for it is the past and the future and your life will fill up instantly with spiritual abundance which will then be followed by physical abundance i promise you okay so kyra says or kira how can we determine when sharing a gift or creation or a sentiment will be generative or when the desire to share might only be ego oriented this is a good question by generative i actually mean um ramping up the feeling inside yourself so to generate means to give birth to. So it's like you conceive it by being grateful. Like I was in the bathtub. I was so grateful for the bathtub. Now, how do I generate more gratitude? I'm so grateful for pure water that doesn't, you know, it doesn't have parasites in it. I'm so lucky. I live in America. The water is clean right out of the tap. I just, I spent five minutes being grateful for that. Uh, I'm grateful we have a bathtub for a lot of my adult life. I didn't have a bathtub that I wanted to take baths in just to shower. Um, how can I generate even more? I'm grateful for the rain. Oh my gosh, I've lived through drought. I am so grateful for every drop of rain. So I start to focus on gratitude and it generates more gratitude. And that generates things like peace. It triggers memories of times when my needs were supplied. And so it creates the spiritual, psychological, emotional state of abundance right there immediately. And you can start it from inside yourself. Okay, Jessica says, what method do you use to move quickly to the three G's when you're struggling or just in a funk? Sometimes I don't. I just struggle for a while, you know, until I get tired of it. I used to struggle for years and or it would just get so painful that I think, uh, you know, I'm so desperate. I feel so bankrupt and so um, emotionally robbed and like I have had so many losses and so much physical pain and everything. I'm really just sick of this and I will do literally anything to get out of it. And I ended up with life has loveliness to sell. Sell all you have, all that pain, all that obsessive attention to your own needs. Sell it all for whatever you can really see as lovely in this moment. There will always be something. There will always be something. You have heard music before. Music like a curve of gold. You don't even have to hear it again. You can remember it. Yeah? This here between your head, between your head, between your ears can make incredible poverty out of wealth or it can make incredible wealth out of poverty. It's all happening here. And I know you're like, ah, I thought you were going to tell us how to be rich. This is how to be rich. If you do this psychologically, physical abundance will follow. My son, Adam, is really, really a good practitioner of the three G's. And he, he truly enjoys things. He's in his room singing right now. Sundays are always singing days. And he sings very, very fervently and loudly. And people have thought that we either have a Tibetan monk who's chanting in the back room or that we're holding someone captive. <laughs> it could go either way. <laughs> but I remember when he was, um, when he was little, he, everything he receives, he receives with such gratitude. Like today he had a, freezer meal for lunch and I, I he opened the freezer and I heard him say oh I love that one and I was like which one is that and he's like no crust chicken pot pie and I was like oh yeah and he was like he set everything out and just like enjoyed it and as a result people have always wanted to give him things when he was getting when my 
older kids were growing through their like elementary school years the girls got to the point where they didn't like cartoons as much but Adam still liked cartoons and I thought the girls wouldn't want to go to the same movies remember going to the movies it used to be a thing but for several years they would go anyway and they would sit on each side of Adam and to me it appeared that they were watching Adam instead of the movie because his joy in watching that was so infectious and it was a clear example Adam his whole life has been a clear example to me of how someone who generates good feeling can make everyone richer instantly so yeah if you're struggling or in a funk stay in it as long as you want when you're sick of it start looking for ways out and you'll find that bartering your misery for loveliness is really really it works okay so Pam says can gratitude lead us to a place where we're so content that we just stop and don't add to the world can you be too content and grateful in other words unmotivated here's the thing where when's the last time you met an ungrateful person who was adding to your joy who was adding goodness to the world when's the last time you met a peaceful person who was making you miserable who wasn't adding peace to the world these values of emotional or spiritual contentment they are intrinsically multiplicative they go out to the world so Byron Katie's who lives in a constant state of gratitude and joy says you know it's not as if love just sits around drooling love acts that's what it does when it sees suffering it immediately goes to suffering and and lifts it into something else or tries to I mean nothing can lift us against our will but there is no such thing as gratitude that doesn't add to the world and there is no such thing as ingratitude that adds anything worth keeping okay so just get deeper and deeper into gratitude you'll see it just it multiplies and multiplies Jane says if I consciously think of gratitude but I unconsciously feel unworthy do the th three G's still work yes they do the unconscious feeling of unworthiness is developed and practice it's a circuit in the brain what fires together a thought wires together into the brain structure so if you've rehearsed a feeling of unworthiness and most of us have been taught to do that by our families the school system church whatever there's a wiring in your head that says you're unworthy but when you break it by forcibly thinking a grateful thought and focusing on gratitude generative um, positive qualities and and generosity of giving you actually break that wiring and you start to form new you fire a new set of of neurons and they start to wire together and you get a happier brain and they've done this in many many studies now uh, especially of people who've meditated over years the brain changes not just during the meditation but the actual structure of the brain changes so that you feel continuously effortlessly more joyful and um, more at peace and more free um Patricia says what are your views on abundance from gambling I've been having abundance and money coming in recently from different sources and even now attracting it when playing the slot machines I had a fabulous conversation with a guy who used to be a compulsive gambler and he told me one day he he heard a voice saying your ex-wife needs money you need to give her money she's really sick and he was like I ain't gonna give her any money that's crazy and he got on a bus that day and his ex-wife was on the bus he hadn't seen her for years and he was like and she was really sick she needed money and he was like I think I'm going to give her some money and that day he went and gambled and he won everything and he gave the money to his ex-wife and then the next day he gambled and he won again and he, he kept winning and he kept started giving it away to people and then one day he said I'm so good at this I'm not giving it away ever again I've given enough and from, he said from that day on I never won a dime so how do I know how the world works maybe the way money tries to get to you is through some kind of unusual thing um, like gambling I don't know but you will feel moved to do it in your own heart and soul you will be guided to do it um, I wanted to finish off by doing some I will give you a generous thing not my own generosity well I guess it is because I'm telling you but it's someone else's generosity I think his name is Craig Foster I watched yesterday a movie a documentary called my octopus teacher that is perhaps one of the most single most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life um it's just this man who is feeling 
sad and depressed. He's a filmmaker in South Africa. South Africa, I just love South Africa and South Africans. He'd lived with the San people, the original inhabitants way, way back. The first people, many think. And um, he spent a year going into the ocean around South Africa and making friends with an octopus and filming it. And he healed himself or the octopus helped him heal from his misery. And the abundance of that movie, I just started crying about 15 minutes into it and never stopped. It, I feel completely forever changed by the generosity of this one man who was playing with a little octopus, maybe this big, I don't know how big it was, not big, a little octopus, they only live a year, but that one octopus changed him. And now it's changed me and people are going crazy over the movie. Go find a way to watch it. It's on Netflix. Netflix, get a friend to, who has Netflix to show it, watch it with you if you don't have Netflix yourself. Watch this movie and feel how the, the beauty and infinite like grandeur of this whole physical reality can be shared in the most unusual and unexpected ways. And right in the middle of the movie, just check and notice how rich you feel in that moment as you're sharing someone else's generative gratitude as he generously gives it to you through the form of this beautiful film. And then think, what can I create that can give those positive feelings to the world? And in the doing of that, you will be rich. And as you get rich emotionally, the physical riches will follow, but you won't even really care because they're not really what you were ever after. You guys make me feel so abundant and rich in my soul. And I'm so grateful for you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I will see you next week on The Gathering Room. Until then, have a wonderful, abundant week. Goodbye.